Hey, a uh, little disclaimer here. So Jarhead uh, in this interview is pretty tired and he uses a lot of like crypto terminology that he doesn't define. So yeah, if you don't understand what any, if, if you don't understand like the terms he's using, uh, I've included a glossary in the show notes. Uh, but if you listen to this, you're probably pretty old, pretty online already. So uh, you should be able to just roll with it. All right, I hope you enjoy. Okay, so I'm here with um, Jarhead again. Uh, you, you're, you're like technically the first guest, although you are in episode two because of a weird numbering uh, <laughs> system that we have we've got, oh, yeah. we've got going on here. But uh, h- how does it feel to be the first returning guest of uh, All Power to the Imagination? I, I think it implies that I have a lot of capacity to imagine, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Since I, I'm a returning guest, I have so much imagination. Yeah, and it's 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 a very powerful imagination. Uh. <laughs> also, you know, just so your just so your guests are all like aligned on why does your why does your return guest sound so loopy or your your listeners? Um, I just got back from uh, East Denver, mm. and I slept like crap yesterday. So, just you know. Yeah. You cut me some slack, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, uh, I don't, I don't have many listeners, but, uh, the ones I do who like really enjoy it, uh, I, I get a lot out of it. Uh, so, you know, this one's for you. Uh, if, if you listen to me, you like know my foibles and tendencies. So, you know, you, you, you're probably okay with it, right? Like, <laughs> uh, okay. So, so I think, I think a good way like into doing this would be for you to actually just tell us what ETH Denver is because uh, I'm sure like a substantial minority like can guess what it is, but uh, I'm sure there's even more who don't know what it is. Awesome. Will do. So ETH Denver is the crypto industry's biggest well ethereum sector of the of the crypto industry it is the biggest conference that there is so basically it's a about like a 10 day long hackathon and then also like a shill fest where you know all the all the crypto companies come together and shill um and it's important to realize that like as much hype as crypto gets in the mainstream, um, it's still very small. Like, you know, as of today, it's a $1.8 trillion market cap. And, you know, that's like Apple and change, right? (laughs) So like, that's, you know, a very small sector of the economy. And it's even more important to remember that the developers who are, are, you know, partly who are largely responsible, but I'd say not entirely because you need a bunch of people in addition to this, right, who are doing all the other activities necessary to get, um, you know, adoption of technology going. There's only 18,000 developers in web in this blockchain stuff, right? And so that's very, very, very small. That's about, I did the math on this, it's about 0.3% of all developers on the planet are working in, in blockchain. So um Anyway, what is Den- East Denver? It's an opportunity to evangelize, to get more developers into into um, blockchain technologies. It's a shill fest where all the companies shill at each other for you know partnerships, customers, all that kind of stuff. And I say shill fest just because literally there's like uh, East Denver is a, in, it, the event itself is incorporated as a cooperative, like the organization that manages it is a cooperative, and um, under a Colorado uh, Limited Cooperative Association. Um, entities right and then uh there's a really when you go there at the event on the map like there's a literally it says like shill like the the shill zone where they place all the people promoting (laughs) it's hilarious i love it right it's like this you are in the shill zone right you prepare to be shilled (laughs) and so honestly i it's kind of one of my favorite things in crypto that if you go into any discord like uh, most discords have a channel that says like sh- shill yourself here. Like that's the only channel where shilling is allowed. Right. So if you're looking to be shilled, this is the place to go, which I kind of love. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's like uh, it's a big shill fest. It lasts many days. There's a uh, Gitcoin has its shelling point event there where they, uh, they, they are, they're, they're big. They're not Ethereum maxis, but you know, they're starting to actually, but 
sort of turn their eye on other technologies. But mm. yeah, they have their they have their whole event around um, the convergence of you know game theory and the commons in the mm. in the Ostromian you know, tradition, and then like uh, economics and uh, blockchain and distributed ledger technologies. They have this. They have their one day conference where they focus on like solar punk visions for the future and all that, which is pretty cool. Actually, I'm glad they appropriated this brand. Um, and I mean that in a good way. I don't mean that they're like, you know, stealing or whatever. It's yeah. good to get more people shilling solar punk um, in more communities. And then um, and yeah, so that's kind of what the what what it was. I went there for four days and I'm just wrecked, mate. <laughs> like I'm back from it. I'm so tired. <laughs> I, I appreciate that you know you're uh, taking a little time out of your day for little old me uh, to talk about. Uh, like this is probably going to be my 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 podcasts are like already pretty rambly and go in a lot of directions, and I think this one's going to be particularly random walky. So uh, yeah, uh, a random walk, <laughs> a random walk with Jarhead. That's that's the title. There we go. Great. Oh, that's good. That's good. Let's do it, man. Yeah. All right. I, I, I think um <laughs> just just some background, uh, listener. Um so I reached out to Jarhead uh like uh what like like October last year. Uh and we we're like I was like, mm-hmm. Hey man, like we should we should do a podcast on like the dawn of everything, the new uh well, at the time the new like Dave the new book by uh the late David Graeber and um the still alive thankfully david wengro uh and you were like yeah fuck yeah let's do it and then uh uh like like all good things uh it did not come to pass um mm. but um i yeah i was um in, in the lead up to this i was sort of reflecting on that because um i think um i think i think there's like like even though you know you, you haven't read much of the book because you know you've got a lot of stuff going on and i i've I, I read it like as, as soon as it came out, I read it and then I'm like rereading it uh, slower. But um, like one thing they really stress is just like mm-hmm. the sort of diversity and like openness and experimentation of, of mm-hmm. like human society um, basically like prior to the emergence of the state. And, um, and like, especially though, I think what is most interesting is like they give, give examples of like it's not you know just like oh you know like hunter gatherers doing like cool hunter gatherer things in their you know little tribe but they're like talking about like Mm -hmm. oh you know like you had like continents like like continent wide like you know networks of like mutual aid uh and like you know these Mm -hmm. egalitarian cities um and like all these other like you know like like basically like really just like (laughs) <laughs> like i um when, when like the book was coming out like one of the things that uh you know got a lot of attention on twitter.com was i think um david wengro like posted some footnotes of them just like absolutely trashing uh steven pinker and like you know uh what's the guy jared Di- yes. jared diamond and like francis fukuyama oh, yes uh which yes like yes. like that that like general sort of you know like evolutionary ladder where like uh, social complexity is like equated to like necessitating necessitating hierarchy um and uh mm-hmm. i i think i think there's like i i, I like b- my vibe <laughs> that i get from like blockchain people is um i think they're really uh they're, they're, there's like obviously like a lot of not great stuff that goes on in that space but um uh like the people who i see as most interesting like also sort of have that energy where they're like no like you know we could do things differently uh and like it's not just you know we're gonna we're gonna talk about it like we're actually gonna try and like make stuff happen uh which which i think is like Mm -hmm. really really cool um and like it's it's obviously not like limited to uh like people in blockchain uh but i think um i think i think like i think like people in blockchain like there's a certain I, I don't know, like ambition in terms of like, you know, scale and possibility that like, I don't know, like trying to run like, uh, like a community garden or something or like, you know, a collective like land project, like th- those things like are nice. And like, you know, the people who are doing it are like certainly admirable, 
but like i think this is like qualitatively different because of like the scope that like a lot of the people uh are like well the people the people like really ambitious like the like the like the horizon they have is just so much um grander um so is is that your Mm -hmm. impression oh yeah definitely so i think like to be clear like you said there is just a ton of uh it's a ton of rugs there's a ton of scams all that kind of stuff and i am here to answer for exactly zero of them right I do not see that as my responsibility and I don't care. Like, I, it's not that, <laughs> like, I, there, it's, you know, whenever someone says, like, oh, there's so many rugs happening in crypto, I'm like, that's cool. What happened in 2008, bro? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, what happens every day with the monetary system? Do you even, are you even aware of scale here? Like, or even, like, you know, I'll give you an example. One of my, one of the people I really respect in the space is Gregory Landua at Regen Network. And, mm. Um, he started off one of his talks at, I think, Cosmoverse or one of these conferences where he basically goes through, um, you know, his theory for the future for the, like the next 100 years is essentially like there are going to be many, many localized currency systems like uh, localized exchange trading systems except built on chain. And uh, he thinks that there will be many, many new forms of money and that we've only scratched the surface of what the, yep. what we can do with money and how we can like, you know, make certain transactions and, uh, you know, ecosystems, resources legible to money mm-hmm. systems. And, and he, then he says, you know, but the way he positions it is really interesting because he goes, uh, so far we, you know, he goes <laughs> thus far with money, we, you know, we've kind of, uh, experimented within this framework of the petrol state <laughs> with its military adventurism backing the dollar. And I basically just think that, you know, we're ready to mm, experiment with nature backed currencies, right? Things that are backed, not by the violence of the state, <laughs> which I thought was like, you have my attention, sir. <laughs> right? And like yeah. that's a, uh, that's one way to get me in. Right. And then I think that, yeah, when you think of um, a lot of the other folks in the solar punkish side of the space, like, I mentioned Gitcoin. I mentioned, uh, you know, that thing that you and I and Emmy worked on for the C4SS a few months ago captures a lot of these projects. But yeah, they have a very expansive long-termist view here where they're like, look, we, we have to, um, they, they work, they work from the back from the end goal. Right. And they say like, we're trying to get to the sustainable regenerative future and we'll get into what all that stuff means. Right. But like, Mm -hmm uh it to do that means we have to be realists about where we are yep. right and like how we got here and that i found very refreshing so like mm-hmm. i think you know the thing i'll maybe leave you with is i was at a brunch this weekend and there was this uh there's this i believe she's a kiwi actually alicia mm-hmm. Dadith. she's the community manager for ens which is the ethereum name service and um, she hosts a weekly Twitter space uh, called Public Goods Are Good, right? And like, this is a thing, man, that I just do not see anyone else really talking about mm. in, uh, not because like, a lot of people talk about it, but there are people trying to do public goods, right? Mm. And the only people that I, I've been my mem- in my limited memory and experience who have tried to do public goods, you know, there's a few um, NGOs that have like, you know, been trying to, do things with it but at the end of the day it's a non-starter because ngos are really more about building up bureaucracy and guaranteeing yourself a salary and and Mm. donor access than they are action right and so you know i was sitting next to her and one of the things that i told her that really caught my attention with public goods are good is that she said um you know how can we uh, guarantee the basic necessities of life for everyone and buddy (laughs) this is a this is a service that is ostensibly just creating you know, identity on, on the Ethereum blockchain, you know, ownable identity in the same way that donate dom, domain name service DNS mm. does for, you know, the, the regular internet. Right. So, and then see that to me, it's really messages that really shows you how ambitious the vision of some of these people are, right. I'm like you're just a little Ethereum name service, but you're here hosting people trying to build, you know, new uh, access to support, uh, uh, social support, community support uh, through quadratic funding and all these other things. Like, this is wild, right? Yep. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that gets my attention. And so 
to come back to the first thing I opened this up with, whenever someone says, hey, uh, are there, aren't there a lot of rugs? Isn't it a scam? Uh, isn't it like bad technology? Doesn't it not actually like do, is it not scalable? And I'm just like, if you're ready to talk about why I'm involved in it, I'm happy to talk to you. Otherwise, I am not answering for any of that crap. All right. Mm. <laughs> take take yeah. these questions elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I um yeah, I, 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 I think um I think there is just like something incredibly exciting. Like even even like, you know, more like like less radical, like more liberal folk, even like my fr- my friends who are like that uh like when when like they you know they they talk about like genuinely ambitious stuff uh i think i think just that is like i think i think like you know even even if they don't want to go all the way i think i think like there is like something refreshing about like people being like okay like you know i i i, I want to like make something i i, I want to like affect the world in a transformative way and like, I'm also going to try mm-hmm. and do the work of like figuring out how mm-hmm. to make it happen, because like obviously, like <laughs> it's like very cliche to point out that like there are a lot of angry people in the world who are like, we, we want to change things. Uh, like you don't have to go very far to find like people of all sorts, but uh, I think I think what is incredibly rare is like people who are you know actually trying to be like. Uh, rational uh i guess for lack of a better word about it and like you know actually mm-hmm. try and like model things uh I, I think you know that like the sort of retort to a uh, a lot of like young people angst at the world is like a lot of it is just like a way to you know uh build community or just like have an outlet and like not actually try and make mm-hmm. anything really happen and i think unfortunately yep. uh in a lot of cases that's true but like i i i think like it's like a similar sort of thing where like even if you know only like one percent or 0.1 percent of like the people getting mad about it are actually doing something uh like there, there's still like just like a lot of there's like a lot of like i i, I feel like there's like a lot of just leverage points um that like can be you know found and exploited um and so like even if you know you like just want to dismiss it all as like you know uh heat and noise i think that you know you, you, you've got to pay attention to like the minority of people who are actually gonna like try like really seriously try and affect things because um mm-hmm. uh like you know it like yeah like you know you can you can like ignore like the majority of people but like like you know like small minorities have changed the world and will continue to do so into the future so yeah (laughs) yeah and i think it's an important point i post about this a lot actually is that like the why the reason why i'm in this space and why i think it's interesting is i can't think of at least two reasons but you know i'll kind of rattle them off here one is that i are you and i've been talking about this for a while but Mm. like the institutional reform and the creation of new institutions is like Mm. one of the things that i think is very interesting and i don't mean like when i say reform like every anarchist podcast like (laughs) oh look at this reformist liberal that's ridiculous i knew he converted like (laughs) i think i i mean it more in the like prefigurative sense you know Mm. so like um that's kind of this is an interesting thing i've observed amongst pe- folks in this space is that a lot of them are doing prefigurative politics and mm. they have no idea what that is yep. and um and the other thing is that they're they're the ones who are more aware and i don't mean aware in terms of like you know they're smarter or whatever they just have you know read a few things <laughs> they came they had a particular path in the space mm. they realize that they're building new institutions and they've read you know ostrom and uh what's that what's that one indian nobel prize winning economist um uh who on poverty he's super uh, yeah, like, I can't remember, I can't believe sen sen amartya yeah. sen right like yeah, they yeah. read they, they've read sen they read like uh uh either i think his wife i think who also was involved in some of his research like they've you know they 
um, yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to be accused of being a horrible, um, <laughs> like a horrible misogynist. You know, that, that woman who's wrote amazing things who also happens to be a Marty Sen's wife or whatever. Like, uh, look, 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 look. I'll just edit around all this. You'll sound super fluid <laughs> and suave. Don't worry about it, man. I got you. Oh, uh, that's funny. Cool. Thank you. Save me for, from getting canceled, sir. Uh, um, but, um, yeah, like they've read, you know, some institutional economics and stuff and they know what they're doing, but then mm. some of them. Um, what I like about it is that they are not waiting. You know what I mean? They're not waiting for legitimacy. They're just mm. building new institutions. And like, yep. I think of a couple examples, like um, this guy is kind of, you know, quickly becoming a friend of mine, um, Griff Green. He has got his hands in every single thing that you hear the word like Ostrom and blockchain. He has started it or seeded it with his money or something. Right. Right. And there's a couple things, right? There's token engineering commons, there's the common stack, and there's Giveth. And so mm -hmm. Giveth recently launched. It's been under development for years, like two years at least that I know of. And what it is, is it's trying to basically disrupt philanthropy and mm -hmm. not in a way that's like playing with the existing players. It's literally trying to redesign philanthropy. So like... I, I'm not going to get into all the token economics and uh, mech mechanism design, but I will say that like, basically they're trying to make it pay to do philanthropy in the way that involves like um, validation, staking of, of, of philanthropy of beneficiaries. Hmm. And so like um, they're trying to make it such that if you donate, they can find a way. Actually, here's a good way to put it. You know how the money printing machine only belongs to the United States right now? Yep. Ultimately, right? Like because of the way the petrodollar works. Mm. They're trying to create a new money system that creates money for uh, for charity and, 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 phil and philanthropic um, endeavors. Mm. And they're trying to build their own money printing machine as an incentive driver to get more people involved to give money to uh, vetted, nice, awesome philanthropic endeavors. So like, yep. you know, you go in there, you send, let's say, 100 USD, they give you a token back, you stake that token and you get um, an annual percentage yield on that token. And that token percentage yield can later be traded for actual money as a way for you to remain invested in the platform. So like there are these dynamics that simply are not available to, you know, um, existing philanthropic, you know, technologies. And mm. the interesting thing is that you know, they're trying to address a couple of things with this, right? They're trying to create a long-term relationship with some of the things that you might be um, supporting. They're trying to make it so that you have a stake in the platform and so that it's does so that you can address at least some of the mis misaligned incentives of the existing philanthropy system, right? Mm -hmm. And so that I think is wild because they're not waiting for anyone to show up and say, you're doing that wrong, right? Like, mm -hmm. I think you and I have talked about this before. We've talked about comrade Mackenzie Bezos, Mm. <laughs> right like if you remember like i say i saw i call her comrade Mackenzie bezos just as a joke because if you don't follow her, her her philanthropic giving she doesn't give a shit or a fuck about how philanthropy works she's hired like a hundred a team of like a hundred people or whatever to just mm. say yo go find me the best vetted philanthropic organizations in you know racial justice in environmental justice mm. in climate justice in you know women's early life education all kinds of things and then she doesn't wait for any intermediary to say oh that's that's a good thing she just gives the money right and mm. that's like when i look at that 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 kind of action is the kind of stuff i can get behind right like mm. i'm not saying that you know mackenzie bays is some perfect you know uh, perfect person with great politics i'm saying that that is a great way to act right that's like that's direct action my friends <laughs> right yeah. like that kicks ass yeah, and so yeah, yeah, yeah. walking it back that's a lot of the cooler stuff that i see here is and you know it's going to piss some people off and a lot of it is going to be wrong right but i think all you can really ask for is that it be wrong in a new and interesting way <laughs> yes because that's how you become right in a new and interesting way exactly yeah yeah i think um yeah i i when you were talking about how like these people were like doing prefiguration without realizing it, my mind like immediately went to, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, you know, just like, it, it's like, you know, a common thing, uh, particularly said by like anarchists, but, um, like, especially like, historians who are like, yeah, like, you know, like all these ideas that, you know, like people with big beards came up with in the 19th century, like they weren't like original, 
it like what was original about it was like it was like a fleshed out like cohesive argument for something but like the actual arguments were like the result of you know this like subculture of like you know uh like middle class like inter- intellectuals and like you know radicalized workers and like all sorts of people just like coming together and you know like drinking mm-hmm. in pubs or like debating in coffee houses and then like what came out of that both both in terms of like the arguments but also in terms of like people's actual practical experience were like you know these like people with big beards whose like names we remember and like all the rest of it is like sort of forgotten but um yep i i think i think like i think like you know basing uh like building building your theory on top of like what people are actually practically doing i think is like really invaluable and um like yeah it, it's like just just because like you know uh like actual social processes are so like complicated and messy that like actually having like proper feedback in terms of like people's experience it's like it's like a form of uh it's like a form of you know i don't know like error correction or like feedback feedback basically yeah uh that like is it like yes. it's, it's invaluable yes. um and like you know yes like, absolutely there's like you know like I, i'm not saying there's like nothing in terms of theory but i think like like i think like I, 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 and i'm saying this part of part of this is like me you know being a nerdy little guy who like writes stuff and like i'm increasingly coming around to like the position that like i i'm basically doing this uh you know like <laughs> like I, I i'm like oh you know like you uh like you know like the sort of like norms that like you know you've found for like organizing in like democratic structures or like how how they can go wrong uh like oh look at me i'm gonna like write you know this very like high level abstract theory that you know like considers like incentives and like you know high information costs and all that but like at the end of the day what i'm primarily drawing on to like make sure i'm not like talking out of my ass is like you know people's actual experience like the actual history of how things went down um and like the the more the more like the more like i look into things i'm like yeah like you know i I, i'm basically like trying to be like hey like you know uh punk kids who like you know do like democratic organizing for something and like you know don't like the how how the marxists are acting uh here here is like a formal like uh argument for like why why this is the case uh so when you know they they pretend to like be backed by science you could be like no fuck you um you know go get them (laughs) yeah 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 absolutely and i think like this backs into um an interesting way to connect it back to what Graeber talks about mm-hmm. in the first like third of the book, what Graeber and Wengro talk about, which is that why I think this is interesting, why the space is interesting is because we've had our, um, our ability to innovate on how we relate and uh, organize in economic systems and how we organize ourselves, you know, politically. Uh, it begins and ends with the state in a lot of people's imaginations mm. these days, right? Like you looked at, you look at the left and they just think about capturing the, for whatever reason, <laughs> like we still have people who think that yeah. if you capture the, the uh, machinery of the state, you'll, uh, you know, take it to a better place. And I got as far in that book to tell it, to read through a very comprehensive argument for why that's wrong. <laughs> right? <laughs> so far in the first third of that book, right. Where they kind of talk about like, the uh the legacy of uh rousseau and mill yeah, yeah, right yeah. when they're talking about uh the noble savage and stuff i don't want to get into all that academic stuff but i do think that it's interesting that dem socks you know yeah. the democratic socialists still exist <laughs> yeah the 21st yeah century. i so i will um, say sorry <laughs> i will say so there was um yeah. i think it was a pew research poll that like i i you know i picked i picked up on because like it was like oh you know like uh, a large number of Amer- Americans like have favorable things to s- things to say about socialism, and then you actually look at what like so so it's you know it's just like a survey question like socialism good or bad, and then 
turns out a large number of people have said like, yeah, it's good. And then it turns out, and then like you look at like what people actually want and it's like, oh, uh, Americans would still like, like less government involvement in a whole bunch of areas. Uh, and I think like the funniest one was like, you know, less, less government involvement in healthcare, which considering like how much of a fuss people made about like Bernie Sanders and Medicare for all is hilarious, but whatever. Um, I, my, 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 my sort of intuition is like, and this is like, I, I, I relate it to like a broader point, uh, is that like, I feel like a, like we're, we're sort of, I, I wish I had more understanding of like the 18th, 18th and 19th century. Cause I'm, I'm pretty sure like there's great analogies to be drawn, but it feels to me sort of like we're, we're, we're sort of like from the perspective of like mass, mass consciousness, we're like sort of in this weird period like sort of akin i think to like early industrialization when like people are moving into the cities and like a lot of activity is like a lot of like people's politics is like a reaction to like what's going on and in terms of like positive uh program like that th- that certainly exists but like it's sort of a lot of it is just like based in like uh like mm-hmm. assumptions from the prior era. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. And I think like the, this is, you know, this is why I see a connection to um, with what a lot of what's happening in a very small Smith sliver of the blockchain space. And mm-hmm. this thesis around, um, you know, the, I can already tell just because of, I've read a lot of the background material that uh, when grow in, um graber are basing the book on even mm. a third of the way in like i tell they've i've talked to you about this book i think i don't know if you read it yet but the um the evolution of human cooperation ritual and social complexity in stateless societies so by, i i literally um, recommended Charles. that book to you oh good did you i don't remember <laughs> i'm like i'm so that's fine. anyway that's fine. i read every i read every single line of that book bro and then i was then i started reading the dawn of everything right and i was like hmm uh, not that I'm not saying that that my home is not like a mysterious one. It's more like this is like the 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 broad audience version of that book right, in a yeah. lot of ways. Like some of it, right? Where Stanish is an academic and he's literally going through like you know mm. uh, how to modify game theory to include anthrop qualitative anthropological data sets. Right? Yeah. Like that's uh, that's a very difficult, boring endeavor for some people. Yeah. But uh, my point being that like you know the both Stanish and this and Graeber's book kind of point to the fact that and if you read the, the the hype and the lead up to this book, the point was obvious that one of the main takeaways is that we've only can see as far as our end of our nose with like, you know, institutional innovation and mm. the universe is so much wider. Right. Yep. And like a lot of this has been pruned for us to think like, Oh, well, you want to change things? You just have to seize the means of, uh, you know, state making or whatever. Yeah, just get in there, you know, make a proposal. But all the stuff works. And it's like, yeah. n- no, no, it really doesn't. And so that's kind of what I like about this, you know, the blockchain space mm. is that there are very real, um, in a very real way, whether they know it or not, they are inventing new political economic institutions. And some mm. of them, like Michael Sargon, Block Science and Common Stack, will state this is the subtext is the text right they're literally saying this out loud and there and there are others like you know and like pat rossin and the people at collectivo and you know my so my friends there who state this plainly like they're like we are doing political economic political economic institutional innovation on the island of curacao with 150,000 people we're going to try to build on-chain uh, localized exchange trading systems that regenerate the ecosystem and the economy right like that's that's pretty wild right and then yeah, like yeah, 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 when yeah. you then question a step further you go uh with like well we want to create abundance for all and i'm like at that point buddy i don't actually care what your politics are right like I'm, yeah, i don't need yeah. you to go ahead and tell me who you declare your <laughs> your yeah, yeah, yeah. allegiance to uh you got my attention friend yeah yeah, yeah. well <laughs> right? I, I i i will say sorry just because um like just because like i so ac- actually one thing i'm trying to do right now that uh, is kind of on the back burner but like i really want to uh like give it a good shot is um uh mm-hmm. so trace out the like history of 3d printing and how things like uh patents 
uh, mm. and like them being, mm-hmm. you know, in the commons versus not, uh, like affected things. Um, because mm-hmm. yeah, and, and 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 like you know that that's really cool. Uh, and actually, so the guy, the guy who designed the RepRap 3D printer, uh, Adrian Bauer, mm-hmm. I think, uh, somehow mm-hmm. I he ended up following me on Twitter, uh, which is fantastic. Um, but like you know, he 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 was just like some you know like English professor of engineering, uh, who was like one day like you know what I'm just gonna make like a really cheap like pretty decent uh open source 3D printer now that all these patents have expired uh and then he did and like uh that that's like super cool and you know like I think connects to you know uh the broader like question of like institutional um like like just like building your own institutions because like you know obviously like technology is connected to that in like a deep way but um one 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 thing that like I am concerned about, of course, is like and like I kind of wanted to just bring this up as soon as you started talking about like regenerative e- like economics and stuff is like you know mm-hmm. I think three D printers are fantastic uh, and like hell yeah let's like move towards a world where like everyone can own the means of production you know on their like bench but like uh, you know like some of the communities that were like most interested in this first were like you know fascists and like i you know i i've like yes. there's like blog posts out there uh that are like hey uh you know this like decentralized micro menu this decentralized like small scale manufacturing uh you know what you know what you could use that mm-hmm. for uh creating autarkic communities where like you know we can just sever our connections to the wider world um and like you know, and like you know if, if 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 you know anything about like stuff like ecology and like environmentalism like mm-hmm. there's obviously a lot of good people in there but like there's also a lot of like like there is like undeniably like you Deep know connections fascist. to like yeah. crazy yeah. far right shit and like i'm obviously mm-hmm. not saying that's like everyone and i'm obviously not saying you know the people in, interested in regenerative economic like ecology and economics are but like you know i all i'm saying is like you know just because someone's talking good game about like things that are essentially positive uh like th- there are, there are like boundaries uh i i still want to draw um and like i like obviously you knew that but like i i i really just want to stress because like i think this speaks to like a broader point of like general malaise and like lack of positive like realistic vision i think um i think like you know people like in our uh like social like like the people like we're friends with online uh and in person like i think i think they're like people who are like really pushing this um and like doing a lot of really interesting like thought and like uh experimentation but also like another group of people who are doing this are like fucking near reactionaries who are like you know thinking quite a lot about how they could use all this wonderful new technology to like do really fucked up shit um and like I, I, I think I think there's like reasons to expect that like people on the margins who are like not who are like cut out from you know uh, institutional power and influence are gonna like j- just for like a variety of reasons are gonna be more expen- experimental and so I think like you know mm-hmm. having that awareness of not just like oh we want to you know fight like the big obvious things but also like there there's like emerging stuff that you know like could become a problem one day and it's like good to keep an eye on that shit even if it seems small now uh yeah yeah i think like well i think one of the main problems too is uh i don't really want to get into this angle of it to be honest but we can if we end up finding it interesting but um the you know how in general the mainstream threads around neo-reaction and fascists are Mm -hmm. like really just a brain scrambling mess of nonsense and what i mean by that is like for us you and i have done (laughs) and people like us have probably read a lot of the formative texts about like what fascism is and Mm -hmm. like you know i'm talking about like kevin passmore's uh short you know the oxford handbook thing those little things on like you know a a very short introduction to fascism there's like Mm -hmm. a number of 
things. And like, you know, because the American discourse around it in particular just gets caught in loops of dumb shit around like (laughs) critical race theory and like, you know, um, mind control and freedom of speech where I'm just like, Oh God, I mean, you talk, cause you know, there's a lot of this, a lot of this controversy has happened recently in crypto too. Like, um, there was a guy who, um, there's a guy at ENS actually speaking of ENS who was recently cast out of ENS because, uh, he's a Catholic with, you know, fascist beliefs for the most mm. part. Right. Like, and I, I, just to be very clear about what I'm saying, right. Um, ultra, ultra nationalist beliefs and, you know, it's anything, the things that he said were not nationalism, right. But like, mm. um, far right pro order, and I mean, like, not embracing the complexity of certain categories and organ- the ways of yeah, organizing yeah. society, yeah. such that you say there are there are clear right and wrong ways of living, and they're my beliefs backed mm. by Christianity. I'm sorry, whatever they're backed by, it doesn't matter. That's fascist, right? <laughs> so, like, if if society, if you simulated or an, organizing a society in the way that this fellow believes it should be organized, uh, where do you think you'd be at, right? So that's why I don't throw the word around lightly, right? Like that's what that is. And then other people are like, well, the left is fascist because they don't let you speak. And that's, you know, Stalinism, which is fascism. And I'm just like, God damn it. Yeah. The Soviets did a shit ton of stuff that actually is and approximates fascism, but it's not letting people talk. (laughs) It's like declassing entire ethnicities and putting them in camps. Right. It's like Circassian genocide. It's like, that's, that's the fascism, right. When you want to talk about, (laughs) right. So anyway, my point being that like, uh, yeah, I think it is exactly right to say, be careful who you align with on ostensibly regenerative uh, green outcomes, because there are green fascists. And I think mm-hmm. that that opens up an entire space of brain scrambling nonsense with crypto people, because yeah, their yeah. political analysis, in my experience, is really, really shallow. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, sh- it's shallow around things like what exactly is fascism and who's mm-hmm. doing it. And it's like, yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, so I will say in their defense, like if you look at like the uh, track record of like supposedly radical leftists, like it's, mm-hmm. it's also like a mess. Um, you know, you've got people being like, Oh, you know, like fascism is like a stage of capitalism and like shit. Like, Oh, oh. God. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like, I like, you know, l- like leftists who like, you know like admittedly like ha- have like considerable skin in the game because like they are targeted by fascists but like you know th- there are leftists out there who are also like really fucking stupid on fascism um and like for sure Absolutely. so I-, I i think i think this like speaks to just like a broader problem of like political miseducation in society um and mm-hmm. yeah like it it really fucking sucks because um like they, they yeah, like you yeah, know the, the, sure. like the the like emerging possibilities like uh, are going to be like seized upon by like you know people who have like a- an idea of what it could be used for and like turned in negative ways mm-hmm. and it's 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 like it's going to be messy and like it you know like we can we can try and like cauterize the damage and like minimize it but like you know bad bad shit is going to go down like that, that's pretty much inevitable mm-hmm. um so yeah that that sucks but um god like point but, to me but point- i think it's really important actually to point yep. out what you said which is like that if you're in the space you should know or spend mm-hmm. a little bit of time trying to figure out like um what are the like simulate the the end goal of a lot of these positions right like i the thing i was talking about the ens guy is you know like if you come out and you say like you know homosexuality is a disease transgenderism isn't real and Mm. like well you know some other when some other that's those are the two i remember right Yeah, yeah um i i i want you to not just like we everyone i'm talking about the left the right like the center everyone is in this little like disinformation vacuum of individualizing things a lot so like the focus of that conversation becomes oh well is what this person said like allowed is that okay to say and who decides and all that and it's like buddy that doesn't matter actually (laughs) like he can say 
they can say whatever they want actually like i and, and but the thing that we're talking about is uh consequences real and imagined of what of what yeah. of those things that are said to other people and what if let's just do the, the little kantian uh, simulation of what if everyone right <laughs> like this right then you can decide how to value those associations right yeah, yeah. like is this a person that you would begin to actually whose mission you would work on like that if that's really what they believe in d yeah. is that something where does that lead right and so i think that we get we get so much of the stuff lost in general like when we get in we individualize it instead we can't have to like think of like this is an agent who can convince other agents yeah, that yeah, this yeah. is a uh, good, worthy mission do i want to associate with that mission oh fuck no Right? Yeah. Like absolutely not. Right. Yeah. So. Well, also, like you know, if you don't like give a shit about anything except like making cool software, uh, maybe you shouldn't. I don't know. Like annoy queer programmers who I hear are, like pretty good. I don't know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, for sure, man. But yeah, so like I think you know the it's funny this confluence of Graber and blockchain that we kind mm. of carved out, right? Because I think like. Um, what, you know, one of the things I'm working on is the, and this is, you know, I'm going to be accused of being a rabid capitalist, but I don't care. Um, there's, a, <laughs> there's this group, this group I'm working with called prime Dow, And what we're building is like DGEN finance tools, um, mm. to let help DGENs make more regenerative choices. And what I mean by that is like, basically we, we built a lot of tools for, um, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, DAOs mm. to, cooperate right and like i think this is very interesting it's the first time i've talked to anyone about it other than the blockchain socialist guy yeah but i can think we can you and i can get even more into the weeds of it what i think it's interesting is basically uh in a very game theoretic sense like the when you think of the landscape of the last like 400 years of um game the game theoretic ecology for like companies right mm. uh it seems to be very like, like in a two by two matrix, there's just like zero, zero, there's like a zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, basically like there's, there's, it's very difficult for you to both choose cooperation, both Mm. choose, you know, like, uh, and choosing not to cooperate is very obvious. And then uh, having people outmaneuver you, right. In each corner of that little uh, matrix. Right. And so there isn't a way for us to really do three, three. Right. And that's kind of what we're trying to do here, which is to say, um, not that, you know, it's interesting. There's a lot of, you know, cushy left folks in blockchain now who are like, we should, you know, eliminate competition and all that. And I'm like, yeah. honestly, if you really run with that assumption, it leads you to very strange and often bad places because then yep. you have to get to the question of how, right? If someone doesn't want to cooperate or if some yeah, organization yeah, yeah. doesn't I, want to cooperate, I, what do I you have, do with them? Sorry, <laughs> right? sorry, sorry to interrupt, but like, I have in yeah. my head like this bro like these these pieces of like this I don't know like paper or like you know like book about like the full fo- like a philosophy of co- of cooperation and competition and like why mm-hmm. just because people don't understand what's going on like discourse around it is just really really fucked and stupid uh and mm-hmm. like like a lot of it is just like you're you're like it's it's this it's like that you know old story of like oh you are like you the categories that you're using are like conflating things that like uh like should not be conflated and once you like start separating them out like what's going on becomes so much clearer um anyway sorry for interrupting but like i i like really feel you on that yeah absolutely and no 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 problem man like that's the thing i think that like when I when I see some of these ostensibly you know nice people saying we should eliminate competition, I'm like you know you, their competition is also reliant on the sort of like the level in an ontology. Like if, I, that's too fancy. Here's what I mean, right? Like basically, if you look at two entities and they're working in the same industry, and yeah. you're like, oh, like we should make it so they don't have to compete in order to win, right? And it's like, but if you zoom out, there's an ecosystem of like. Mm. customers and inputs to it and all that that also benefit from their competition yeah, yeah. you know and so like there is like there it, it really is a matter of you saying it's good here and not there and it's like but you yeah. just kind of zoom out and look at the whole system right yeah, and so yeah, like yeah, 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 this yeah, is yeah. i think 
at least one way that uh, when you when you hear some anarchist economic uh, political thinkers, they're thinking they'll say like, you know, competition uh, cooperation is possible through competition, and that's one of the ways I took that argument to mean like, yeah, at a higher level of abstraction, there's cooperation happening because you know a group within a society, a group of agents or whatever, is organizing to go in a particular direction, and within it there's competition happening, but overall they're going in a positive, some direction and yeah, that's yeah, fine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, so I mean, like, <clears throat> Oh, go ahead. thank you for that. Yeah. So I think, I think actually a bit like another thing that's really interesting, and this is a, this is something that they like the Wengo and Gareva get to towards the end of the book is about how, like, uh, they argue that like relations of dominance, are actually like, they, they argue that like in a lot of cases it emerges from like caring relationships. So like, you know, someone cares for you and you're dominating over mm-hmm. them. And like that, that makes the relationship like much, much stronger. I, I can't remember like the specific like chain of logic that leads to it. But um, I, I, I think like, I think there's like, I think that like, uh, like discourse around, this is why I really wish want to like nuance the shit out of like all these concepts because like, the the problem is is like mm-hmm. you know if if you're like in a hierarchy like the people within that hierarchy like are actually doing quite a lot of cooperation right like <laughs> yeah like just because yeah. like they're being just because they're being dominated like does not mean like cooperation is impossible and like working together is impossible um and so like you really need to be nuanced nuanced about this sort of thing and be like okay like w- what's actually going on at like the micro level like you can like sort of say like oh you know like because like the people at the top just have like such overwhelming force that like you know if the people at the bottom like try to quote unquote defect from them like they can just like steamroll them and they won't take that much loss and so like you know you've got like this Nash equilibrio where like, you know, the people at the bottom have to cooperate and people at the top can like defect at any time. And like, they, they don't really have to care because like they hold it over them. But like, I do think like things are more nuanced than that. And like, you really have to like stop being like, mm-hmm. okay, like it, it isn't just like, you know, the simplistic, like uh, we play, you know, a prisoner's dilemma with each other and like, you know, under certain conditions, like, you know, you get like crazy amounts of cooperation. Like, Thing, things are like far more complex than that and um i think like i think just like god like <laughs> just tying everything back together uh so like like a lot of i think like the and i i so i think in terms of like people who really think about these things a lot like a lot of people who do that are still like pretty fucking stupid about a lot of things and i think like one mm-hmm. of the reasons is is like the sort of cooperation uh competition slash like domination uh like just that that all those like ways of interacting are like they're Mm -hmm. they're, like radically simplified uh and like there's all these wonderful little nuances there that are like worth exploring and it's so much more fascinating to like when you actually can like talk about them properly and like part of why everything is part of why everything's fucked up it's not the only reason but it's part of it is like we just don't have good ways to talk about this and so like we've got like very blunt yes. answers and that just like i think like what's going on right now is like the systems of governance and i mean that in just like you know way, ways to like ensure that people like don't like step on each other's toes and like fuck each other over uh, and that can be like anything from, you know, like a regulatory state to like not wanting to like fuck with your neighbors because they will fuck with you in the future if you do. <laughs> um, like we don't have like that. Those systems are like not as complex as like the the like society that they are trying to control. And so like you have all these things like breaking down and you've got shit like, you know, uh, like fucking Canada, like just like you know putting in like crazy fucking uh measures uh to like stop a protest which like you know i i i i disagree to like to use the you know fucking cliche like i disagree with like the like what those truckers in canada are protesting for but i am damn freaked out by like you know the blanket like restriction of financial uh 
uh, mm -hmm. options that like Canada is trying to throw at them right now. Uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I, I just think like what like what we've seen in like the past like decade is like we don't have nuanced solutions to this that like can actually work and you know people are fucking pissed off about it and like it's a fucking mess because you know we don't have like the the language that like we inherited the models we inherited outside of like you know a very small minority of a minority of a minority is like not 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 helpful and like that that's that's really exciting and also terrifying because <laughs> yeah yep yeah absolutely man and i think like uh the um the nuance around this too is very interesting because in within i can tell you from being involved in the space right um the the language around you know, these decentralized autonomous organizations, the, when you start to talk to them and why I told you originally when I was like, Oh, you're for the abundance for all or whatever, like other, other nice terms, no bosses, uh, less hierarchy, like letting people work and all that. It's, it's really interesting because there isn't, this is one place where I think folks could actually benefit from reading a book. <laughs> and what I mean on that front is that like, when I ask folks, I'm like, yo, so why are we organized as a DAO, right? People will be like, oh, it's because, you know, uh, we just want people to be free to work, you know, sometimes without bosses and like, you know, we want to, you know, like you, this, that, and the other and hierarchy and horizontal, whatever. And I'm like, cool. Now, Frank, if I then ask you as Frank, if I say why, I would expect a deeply nuanced answer around workplace domination, destruction of epistemology, etc. right? Like epistemic, you know, freedom, that and the other. I've asked people, why? Why is that good, right? And people don't really have an answer. They're just kind of like, well, you know, it's because mm. like, I guess we can control the means of what we do and all that. And I'm like, no, no, like you need to have, in my perspective, you need to have an ethical and an epistemic grounding for this. Mm. Otherwise, why are we doing it, right? Like, and you know why? Because if you don't, this is what happens. You will have someone go, hey, this isn't working. And there's no basis for you to work this way. So what do you do? You just you define corporate structures and you become a corporation on chain, honestly. Mm. Right. And like and and all of that possibility that you decided to organize for originally is gone. <sighs> Oof, yep. Gone. Right. And so now what's funny about this actually i want to talk about this next because i think you'll get a damn kick out of this i'll send this to you you can put it in the show notes too all right um are you familiar with are you familiar with sushi swap uh i've heard of it but i couldn't tell you what it is cool let me give y'all you and the, some of the, the listeners a little bit of background right so sushi swap was a fork of is a fork of uniswap and uniswap is the biggest decentralized uh exchange that there mm. is for crypto so a decentralized exchange that a high level is basically just one that doesn't have custody. Um, like uh, Coinbase, for instance, right, has custody of your assets. You don't own the private keys that are associated mm -hmm. with the crypto that you buy on Coinbase. So Coinbase has custody of it. If you don't have the private, there's a kind of a saying amongst, at least amongst the anarchist hackers in the space, which is if you don't own the private keys, you don't own the crypto, right? Mm -hmm. And so like there's a lot of, and now Sushi and Uniswap, um, you will use your own wallet, right? Which is your keys. So you own the crypto and you are, but it also comes with the danger of like a lot of other things, right? You're interacting with a protocol. Um, there's no protection. There's no like middle layer. There's no authentication. There's a whole bunch of, well, I don't mean there's no authentication. There's no like, you know, like you log into Coinbase, right? And you like have to validate stuff with like two factor authentication. Are you sure this is what you want? You know, that kind of stuff. There's none of that, right? So now Uniswap, uh, a while back, I think probably about a year and a half ago, was forked by SushiSwap because SushiSwap realized correctly, they were like, wait a minute, we are using Uniswap and we're buying the Uniswap token and we don't accrue any benefit for holding the Uniswap token to secure the protocol and, you know, all that. So what they ended up doing was SushiSwap forked it and they gave users of the, of the, of the protocol and holders of the token five percent apy for holding it right so like basically you're getting paid to secure the platform and this was they then executed a vampire attack which just means that they found a way to tell people hey you're on uniswap come to sushi swap where you get paid to do the same thing 
Now, Uniswap is doing something like, I don't know, uh, a fifth or of, of the volume of Uniswap, maybe. I don't know. Someone will probably correct me, but they're nowhere near as big as Uniswap. But here's why um, I bring this up, because recently there was a ton, there's a ton of controversy. SushiSwap is like a, a, a drama, like a center for drama. <laughs> like it's the political drama, the soap opera of crypto indexes, basically. And um and, you know, like this founder, that founder leaves, there's this bust up, someone was stealing, whatever. There's all kinds of things happening. But I think it's interesting because recently the CTO of uh, SushiSwap left, uh, Joseph DeLong, because a bunch of stuff surfaced about, you know, he was like abusive or like whatever, like, you know, abuse in the workplace and not, not, you know, not sexual, physical or anything like that, just like, you know, yelling or whatever, right? Um, and Joseph came to ETH Denver and gave a talk called uh let me make sure i don't butcher this i just was, thought it was so funny and i want to make sure that i ah yes here it is so um he was basically gave a talk that was a sushi swap postmortem because he left sushi swap i don't know mm. if he was fired or not i don't remember but um the name of the talk was the case for hierarchy in DAOs, and i thought that this was hilarious coming from this guy because this talk might have also been called my failure at figuring out how to work not as a boss <laughs> it's like basically <laughs> right but the focus of his talk is why dow needs high dow, why dow's need hierarchy and you know what his um what he does he actually takes the tyranny of structurelessness right mm -hmm. and he makes an argument from that point and i'm like i feel like everyone continues to misunderstand that paper for, mm -hmm. like to this day right but anyway um he goes i'm keenly aware that this is deeply unpopular and like he go, he thinks the ideal of running completely horizontal organizations without leaders isn't viable. It doesn't actually work. And I'm just like, buddy, nobody ever said that you don't need leaders, mm -hmm. right? Like one of the main things for me, and maybe an anarchist will come after me for this, is my problem with leadership mm -hmm. is that there is no way to censure leaders. There's no way to make fun of them. There's no way yeah. to get rid of them when they're not functional. That's and like, you know, that's one of the main problems. So like if we all around us all go, yo, this person is, is going to organize and coordinate for us. And, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, the problem is that we, in, we entail so many other things with that, right? Yeah, 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 we yeah, yeah. entangle, we entangle monetary benefits. We entangle yeah, yeah, upside. Yeah. We entangle power to hire and fire all of these. And it's like, I feel like there's, this is the nuance that you need under it. Cause yeah, this yeah, guy's, yeah. like I said, sitting here. He might as well just give a talk about how he doesn't understand how to um, how to make himself how to render himself um, you know moot. That's what a good leader does, right? Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. over time. And yeah. so, like that's the nuance we need around hierarchy and around why we're working in this way. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> I. That's hilarious one, but um, also yeah, no, I think that again, like I think like leadership is like one of these like you know like it's one of these words that like people use to signify a bunch of different shit and like the various yep. things it signifies is like actually in conflict with each other and like if we could mm -hmm. you know tease it out it would just make things so much easier and like yeah it's just like again like you know we should we should like all just step behind a rosy and veil of ignorance and we should like all just debate this out and then we can come out and we're like oh okay cool let's uh let's go you know like go to an anarchy because like that's obviously you know like what everyone would come to if they uh talked it out clearly uh no no <laughs> i'm i'm joking but uh i i really i really do like it it's like fucking like to use the awful phrase it's like very red pilling uh to see just how much like oh like this debate that you are having over this thing is like you, you you can't actually resolve it uh because like what you're actually arguing is like uh, about like these concepts that you refuse to actually differentiate uh because if you yes. did you'd be like you'd be like oh shit like there's so much more out there that we actually have to consider and like deal with mm -hmm. and it's it's like a way to like fence things in um and yeah it's just like I don't know. It, it, it's, 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 it's a lot. It's a lot to deal with. Uh, especially cause like, like a lot of people, a lot of people are like who, you know, like there's a lot of fucking stupid people out there. Right. But there's also a lot of smart people who like also get stuck in these mm -hmm. traps and like, 
that that's like the real concerning shit because then then of course like the immediate response of is if like you know you're epistemically humble is to be like oh am i doing that um which i i think on one hand is good but like you know also causes you to have like crises of conscience and like oh shit am i actually wrong about everything because like you know i'm reading like some wackadoo like reactionary and they're like oh did you know that like thing happened that you haven't considered and then like you know you go down a rabbit hole of like oh is this actually important um so yeah it, it, i can understand why people don't do it it's it's a lot of energy but at the same time like it's it's also just like really embarrassing that like these people who are supposedly like uh who have got like you know these grand fleshed out furies are like making these very basic errors um <laughs> yeah definitely um and i think like like you said uh just getting this is why i actually we didn't even talk about this but one of the things you know when i went to uh, coming back out of this people ask me so how was it like especially on the team you know at like prime and other places be like so how was it what was your takeaway and i was like got folks i am so bearish on DAOs, even more even more bearish than i was before but i am super bullish on my friends actually like my friends in the space that I'm working on within these, within these things where I'm like, man, I am just so bullish on people who understand the actual things that we're doing here. Mm. Like it's wild, bro. Um, and so like when I, when I think about the fact and I'm, what I mean by that is like folks who have come to this with a level of nuance that, um, that is born in, um, experience, right? Mm. <laughs> like, I'm not going to name any names, but I will just tell you that I know there are, I am so excited for people I know who have been, you know, consultants in organizational design, who have been coaching people on horizontal organization, um, liberating structures within companies, um, you know, like people like who've been on like podcasts, like leader morphosis, where they talk about, um, how to self-manage without bosses in the workplace mm. from organizations as small as, you know, 10 to 400, right. Mm. Or even like a thousand. Right. So those folks now looking at this space and looking at the information processing advantages of smart contracts, the data, um, the, the data analysis that can come from things like that. And the way to just kind of experiment with mm. new ways of being and relating it's it's got me mega bullish the problem is that those people are 99 point the rest of the, they're 0.02 percent of this of this dow space right mm. i think the, the estimates i last saw are something like um i think something like two hundred thousand or half a million something in that range of people work in DAOs right now and when you think about how many of them actually come to it with an experience of how to actually facilitate and solicit yeah, uh, yeah, input from people in liberating structures. It's very little, but I have hope for that, right? And so yeah. that's why I think I'm super bullish on this. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Still, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> just bearish so, on the space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I will say, and God, just I'm so good at this. I, I, I notice when I like I have conversations with people now, I like constantly am just like referring mm-hmm. back to stuff I previously said. Anyway, it's a fantastic yeah. thing to do if you're a podcast host. Believe me. Um, <laughs> no, but um. <laughs> So Graeber is like his like uh his like early stuff um that was like you know him uh talking about like his stuff with like um uh the alter slash anti globalization movement uh like yeah. one of the one of the things he brought up was like oh uh you know turns out like the people who like most like just get how to do like the sort of direct democracy that like you know uh like the people who are like taking part in these protests like the people who just get how to do that are like mostly just indigenous Mm -hmm. people and like you know Mm -hmm. it's us like uh, us us as westerners who like supposedly live in like a democratic society like actually have to like kind of learn like how how to act in this way um and you know it's like so much more of a learning curve um Mm -hmm. and yeah i think um that's like a part of it but like i i wanted to bring this up when you like you know you were talking about 
uh like people being like unable to justify like organizing like this and then like reverting back to more hierarchical forms i think like that is that is true and i think there is like a danger of like not having like a worked out argument and being like you know uh like just being like oh like i can't justify it but like i i kind of like it but like uh okay fine i'm just gonna do what you say yes. but i think like i feel like you know people yep. like i mean I, I mean so like one it seems to me like a lot of people in this space are like you know pretty well educated and like you know tech savvy and so like you know even if they don't like know an argument i think if like you came to them and you're like hey like you know uh could you justify like why you organize like this i think like they could do the research for themselves uh and like figure it out and you know like maybe like one of these days we'll have like a a like you know some like medium post or something that's like why organizing in DAOs is really good uh and like it'll it'll just be like oh yeah like you know here are a bunch of things and then like you know it'll, it'll just be like this like one central uh like thing that people refer to and it's like oh, okay cool like you know that that's not really an issue anymore but um even if even if like that doesn't come to pass i think just like the experience of like being like oh like you know i worked in like a hierarchical firm before and like it was pretty shitty and now i'm like working in this dow and it you know it has all these benefits and like even if i can't articulate like why this is the case like i have this first-hand experience and so the people i work with and so like you know if someone like tries to come in is like oh you know i'm gonna like try and set up a system and so I can boss you all around. I think like, you know, just, just having the experience and be like, no, like, you know, we, we don't have like, you know, some like fleshed out justification for this, but like, you know, we've all like, we've all done it or, you know, we know people have done it and it fucking sucks. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you can go fuck yourself. Uh, even if, you know, we can't like be like, ah, okay, well, <laughs> ha ha have you read the 1994 classic Seeing Like a State? Oh, you haven't? Oh, sit sit down. Uh, let me regale you. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, you, you, de you definitely don't need that level of thing. But really, like you definitely need to be like, um, you know, you have to have something to fall back on, right? Yeah. Whether it's... Um, it, whether it's something like an ethical stance, an epistemic stance, some kind of stance, right, for being mm -hmm. like why this is better. Otherwise, like someone, like you said, someone's going to come in and be like, like the sushi swap CTO is going to come and be like, ah, oh, you know, uh, that doesn't work. And all the companies that ever have succeeded have done it in X way because mm -hmm. I'm right, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. and like, like I believe literally, I believe I don't, I missed part of, I saw part of his talk, and I believe one of the things he said was something to the effect of like, um, where was it? It was, um, uh, 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 oh yeah. Okay. This is really funny. Actually. He said he, he, this is so funny. He made this kind of circular argument where he ends up saying that like the reason why fortune 500 software is bad because it does its product design without structure. Too many people get involved pushing for their particular priorities. It makes the software everything and nothing, which I thought was hilarious because I, my interpretation being inside of these structures is almost the very opposite. It's because domination mm. causes people who otherwise would be incentivized to care to not give a shit about doing a good job to please mm. their masters to keep their job. Mm. right like that's that that's one of the examples right and then like you know then he, he draws basically a point to like structured leadership and agile to basically saying that like a uh, product lead who decides what goes in and what doesn't and the primary point of the software is is leading it and that there's always been in history of humans organization there's always been hierarchy and i'm just like uh yeah yeah <laughs> this is this is when you're like oh and, uh the dawn of everything uh, also, you know, th those those 500 pages also means that like doubles is a pretty good brick that you can throw at him. Um, so exactly and exactly. And it's like you need to read just the first 100 pages of that to yeah. realize why this is a bullshit argument yeah, yeah, that yeah. has been shaped for the benefit of a class of people throughout the ages. Right. Where it's yeah. like, well, no. And that class, of course, is fluid. It's not the yeah, same yeah. one. Right. I'm not a Marxist. But like, <laughs> yeah, it's just something to be cognizant of. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's it's just um, like I I this is so I um I listened uh to like the first episode that we did uh markets in the name of socialism um and mm -hmm. like 
and oh and i'm also writing a review of it a, a rewrite of my review of it um because like oh okay yeah, nice yeah, I, I i i get really spicy towards the end and i like say a lot of shit about marxism so you'll enjoy that uh but yes <laughs> but i think um i think like one thing that like is really clear to me uh is just like how clumsy and like just yeah just how clumsy and like inept like the uh like the the attempts at like shaping propaganda were and like the only reason mm-hmm. it worked in terms of like oh you know we are going to like you know we're gonna like try and shape economics to be like this really like just basically like an engineering discipline where it's like okay like you know mm-hmm. you can use this to like just optimize like particular outcomes and don't think about like you know anything broader and then you know of course like and then like uh joanna bookman like recounts like many many times on both sides of the cold war people are like hey uh we're gonna think about like broader you know systemic stuff and like <laughs> turns out you know you guys are full of shit and then it's like uh well we have all the money so fuck you uh <laughs> exactly <laughs> so like <laughs> and, yeah and it's like, like yeah exactly like like i feel i like i don't i don't like I, I i am very cognizant of the fact that like you know it like trying to win like the battle of ideas in terms of like popularizing it among like like the general public is like basically impossible but i think like i think like we can definitely like you know be like hey uh you know, you really like, you know, reading like Insight Porn on like Ribbon Farm or State Slate Star Codex. Would you like to read like a thing about how like, you know, economics is actually being shaped by elites and that like, uh, oh, I don't know, um, you know, like there's like all these institutional considerations that like, you know, they downplayed. Uh, would, would you like to like read about that and then maybe, I don't know, like recount it at like one of your parties with smart people? Uh, like secondhand and like half remembering it and like feel really smart <laughs> because you know about this. Uh, like I, I, I think like, you know, just like appealing to people's natural sense of like contrarianism uh, could go a long way in this mm-hmm. regard. Oh, for sure. And I think like, you know, like you said, the, it's not that economics isn't real, right? It's just that like, there's so much more to it. And it's funny, yeah. this is another way that I like coming into the space is that when people ask me why I'm involved in it, is like, I um, I still kind of hold the line of free market anti-capitalists, right? Yeah. People, you know, so, so a lot of people actually get that, right? Because a lot of the folks that are in crypto understand institutional distrust mm. and in- regulatory capture and a number of other things that purportedly, you know, make this, you make capitalism, quote unquote, crony capitalism, right? Mm. And I, uh, I think that the, the part of this movement that is the most interesting is the part of it that is trying to invest in public goods, who mm. views what they're doing as public goods. And so there is a strong disincentive never to block anything up behind IP. There's a strong disincentive for like, you know, making sure that it's freely available and cheap and broadly accessible to people who can't pay uh, the gas fees, right? If you're not if you're not available, if you're not aware of what gas fees are, you have you think of the specifically uh, proof of work and proof of stake chains as uh, distributed computers where you have to pay a certain amount to make transactions, right? Whereas when you're on Facebook or what have you. You're making transactions, but they're paid for in other ways, i.e. you're being monetized and therefore please hang around in our wall in our walled garden. Right. And so even in this whole like public goods approach, I think is very interesting because yeah. like you said, what you're saying earlier, where we um, we can we can appeal to people's sense of contrarianism a little bit. We can it's very easy. This, this is an undercurrent to a lot of things, especially in American politics, where you mm-hmm. ask people like, "Hey, should healthcare be free?" And you never specify how. You right? You don't say Medicare for all. Mm-hmm. You don't say like like Canada. You don't say like whatever. Even even the garden variety reactionary <laughs> yeah. will be like, "Yes, absolutely." Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and so like, I feel like there's a lot of good you can do here with the word public goods. Mm. If you don't call them welfare, if you yeah, don't yeah. call them like, 
you know, social security or like well, something else, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, TLDR, uh, leftists need to like learn what the fuck marketing is. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And 100% you do because I think like, and I also think that even a lot of people in blockchain do because people frown upon marketing. I'm like, nah, dude, you got to shill. Like you got to tell people how this thing works and why they need to use it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you need to get out there and you need to break down the hundred thousand different varieties of people there are and think about how we get them in the space, right? Like one of the things that I think is really interesting is um, Olympus Grants. Like Mm. there's a lot of interesting people who work in it. And one of the main things that they're focused on is how do we get the next billion people onto crypto who are below a certain latitude, right? In the global South, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's like the, that's the main thing that they're focused on, which I think is really great, which is which, because think about like even all these protocols that are worth a billion dollars in these, you know, these companies like Coinbase or whatever, how much are they really investing in getting, uh, you know, some, some democratic uh, Republic of Congo or, uh, you know, like, or some Central African Republic or whatever people onto onto this thing to yep. give them some resiliency to currency devaluation and yep. you know some tyrant cross-border war and what yep. have you right yep. i don't i would wager not much right yeah, yeah, and yeah. like and i also would wager that they shouldn't be doing it because they're just trying to pad their statistical bottom line but i mm-hmm. think that if we can find ways for those folks to participate yeah. and gain resilience in other ways that's on their on their terms then this is like crazy right this is like like yeah, yeah. this this is like an amazing possible future basically <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah no i completely agree yeah no i think um like <laughs> i i don't know if i'd ever like do it but um i have been like thinking to myself like if i really wanted to like shape the future of like humanity uh the place that i would go would be like africa uh both because you know it is the youngest continent in terms of just population uh and also because like in terms of institutions uh and like you know yeah yeah basically like institutions and like like state structures and stuff like they don't have much Mm -hmm. like the stuff they've got there is like pretty weak uh and so like that means that uh and like there's there's not much like you know infrastructure set down uh in like both in terms of like social stuff and technical stuff and so like that means they Mm -hmm. can like basically leapfrog over like what we have in the west Um, yes and so like i i I don't i don't know like if i could actually do that uh if i was healthier and younger maybe but um like if i if i was like i'd be like really really seriously considering it uh there's like there's like like the the obvious examples of like technical stuff they're doing is like um just skipping landlines completely because um mobile phones are so good yeah and also like not even bothering with like the old centralized uh fossil fuel power infrastructure in a lot of places because like you know uh renewable energy has gotten so cheap and so like they can build from the ground up like this far more uh decentralized uh grid it's it's not like it's not obviously like perfect but like it it will probably look a lot different to what we have in the west because like they could start mm-hmm. from, from nothing uh and like do it for themselves and i yep. think i think like i think like that that how that all intersects with like blockchain stuff is like really really fascinating and like if you had to ask me to yep. like bet money about like where like some of the most fascinating stuff will be adopted at scale uh, I would bet in like places like uh, Africa. Yeah, for sure. And actually, that's a that's an overlap of so many interesting points because the the reason why Africa is in its is in the current plight institutionally that it is largely is because of Europe, right? There's a mm-hmm. great book written by this Marxist uh, Walter Rodney um, called uh, "How Europe Underdeveloped Africa," and he does an a economic analysis of the 400 500 years of exploitation and Mm. gets down to the level of like ledgers from all the various joint stock companies that dominated africa and he makes it very fucking obvious dude like population growth of africa stagnated for like 300 years it was the same population like from about the 1600s up until decolonization 470 million people on the continent right Mm. and no it's 
phenomenal. It's it's staggering. Like when you think about like what happened uh, from from the shipment of of human beings across mm. the, the ocean, from exploitation, uh, from literally sabotage of economic systems, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, why I think that's interesting is that the legacy of the relative quote unquote weakness of institutions in Africa, I perceive, is mostly because the Westphalian nation state system. Basically, mm. what did it do after decolonization? This is the choice. We're gonna in every place they left, they're like we they appointed leaders and they bequeathed these institutions to them. These institutions were not of them, right? This yep. is not like this was an opportunity for amazing institutional innovation, and they were just put into the same bullshit that we are. And yep. then a lot more so, more so for that, they're lambasted for it for having you know dysfunctional quote unquote institutions. I'm like, buddy, this is bullshit. None of them like. None of them wanted this, right? Yeah, like yeah, this yeah. isn't what they signed up for. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and they're just now ruled by proxy by like all these puppets here and there. And it's complete nonsense. So I think I completely agree with you that there is an opportunity to reclaim that heritage yep. of saying, you know, to tie it all together in a nice bow of yeah. uh, indigenous institutional innovation, possibility and everything, right? Going forward. And I absolutely agree that like at the continent of Africa is like the place to watch for shit like this because um, they it's the least entrenched. It gives, there's a reason why America has a bunch of shadow bases all throughout there. It's not only Islamic terrorism. It Just think about all the things, you know, quote unquote Islamic terrorism. Think about all the things that America has done in these weak mm-hmm. states, right? Yep. Like whenever something this, like this happens, America is there, right? And why is that question? Well, you know, they want to prop up the state system in a lot of ways. And I look at this and I'm like, man, there is so much possibility if if, the, yeah. if we all invest in the success of Africa on Africa's terms. <laughs> That's amazing to me. All right. I think actually that is like the perfect fucking place to leave it. So, uh, all right, <laughs> let's wrap up. Cool. Can I, uh, can I chill? Yeah, so you, uh, like every other opinionated cis man, have started a podcast. So what is it? (laughs) Ah, yes. So there's this notion of the ownership economy or the pownership economy, as some of my my anarchist followers have been poning me with the name, uh, which I thought was very funny. But basically, it's focused on this notion of like, by broadly expanding access to democratic governance uh, with te- and court with coordination technologies, what can we do for broadly distributing wealth? Right, this is what mm. we're calling like the ownership economy. And um, looking at the legacy of cooperatives of you know other democratic forms in the workplace, and then also a hundred years of scholarship in mm. economic de- democracy, basically, um, and bringing in the people who are doing it. Right, so we're talking about like. Uh, we're going to talk to some people from the UN, actually, who are in uh, sustainable development goals. Who are looking at the stuff. We're talking. Uh, we're we're hoping to get people from the actual U.S. government. So don't cancel me. Um, and then you know, actually, and then you know, founders, workers, people who are involved in this movement and outside of it, Web two even, who are organizing as platform cooperatives. So we can kind of you know chart a future for like what does the ownership economy look like and who's going to benefit and how is it taking shape so that you if you're out there and you're like i want to participate in this i don't just want to be dominated by my bosses at work you might you know those of you all listen to it can check it out so it's the ownership economy it's on anchor fm on every platform and in apple podcasts and on youtube and we uh, have released three episodes so far uh nathan schneider the co-op um big co-op guy and professor at uc boulder is our first person we have uh Pia Mancini, who is an amazing democratic uh, activist, and then also the CEO of Open Collective, who's making them a community-owned project. The second, and I think you and I talked about this before, but we had a, a guy from Ethic Hub, a company that's building financial rails for the global south to get mm. loans on chain and markets for their products mm. uh, on infrastructure that they own was episode three. So that's yeah. kind of the bent of the podcast. And, you know, come check it out. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, you know, against Utopia on Twitter. Although, if anyone listens to this and doesn't follow you, uh, please send me a private message because uh, I want to know what's up. You sound like a very interesting person <laughs> with very specific tastes. So, uh, yeah, uh, yes, come talk definitely. to me. Uh, we, you can shit, shit talk Jarhead uh, in my uh, DMs where he can't see. Yes, um, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, 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 I like, I, I just want to say, and this is like very self flattering, but I think like the way like we wrapped up towards the end with just like everything converging together was like 
I, I, I think like that's like like very very good uh and i think it like speaks to uh both of our uh like ability at you know shit talking and also just like our friendship uh so so with that with <laughs> the power of friendship making good podcasts uh i think i'm gonna leave you listeners yes